In 2012, a Lupin spin-off series started airing, called The Woman Called Fujiko Mina. This would be a darker, edgier, and more adult take on the Lupin franchise, with big names working on it, such as Shinichiro Watanabe of Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo fame, Sayo Yamamoto, known for her work as director of Michiko Tohachin and Yuri on Ice, Mari Okada, the writer behind series like Anohana, the cult favorite Masaki Iwasa, who's directed shows like Ping Pong the Animation, and Takeshi Koike. This darker take on the Lupin formula would turn out to be popular enough that there would be demand for more. And as such, Takeshi Koike, the man behind anime like Redline, would end up directing, as of August 2020, three sequel movies to the spin-off series The Woman Called Fujiko Mina. Yo, what's going on guys? I'm the Anime Top Scholar, and today we're going to be taking a look at Takeshi Koike's Lupin trilogy, and see if they are worth the watch. So the first of the three movies came out in 2014, and it's called Jigen Daisuke no Bohyo, or Jigen's Gravestone in English. It was originally split up into two parts of roughly 26 minutes each, and was later released as a movie. The same goes for the other two movies. The story takes place in a fictional country called East Oroa, which is known for its low crime rate. Lupin and Jigen is there to steal the treasure known as the Little Comet, but stealing it is not going to be an easy task, as East Oroa has fortified its borders and security after a singer known as Queen Malta was assassinated in the neighboring country of West Oroa while she was holding a concert in an attempt to quell the tensions between the two countries. Jigen had been hired as a bodyguard by Queen Malta, but failed to protect her. And now, while trying to steal the little comet with Lupin, he's come face to face with the very same assassin who killed his client in West Oroa, Yael Okusaki, a skilled sniper who's known for preparing tombstones of his targets before he kills them, as well as rolling a dice to determine how many shots he needs before he can kill them. And this time, Jigen is his target. So as the title suggests, this movie predominantly focuses on Jigen. Just like the woman called Fujiko Mine gave her a good backstory and broke down the character, Jigen's gravestone tries to do the same here. Not so much through backstories though, but mostly looking at Jigen as a character. A laid-back gunslinger for hire, who takes pride in doing a good job, and is very confident in his gun skill. This side of Jigen is explored through his encounter with Yael, who is also a very skilled gunman and he might even be better than Jigen. This rivalry is nice because it allows them to push Jigen out of his comfort zone. We all know that Jigen is never going to lose a gunfight normally, so seeing him being pushed into a spot where he might actually end up getting killed by someone who's a better gunslinger than he is could make for an interesting new look at Jigen. But there is a keyword in that sentence. Could. Now, I like this idea as a concept, and the movie is definitely very fun, but I have to knock it a little bit for execution. You see, Jigen is a very cool character, but not a lot shows on him. He gives some hints here and there, when something really gets to him, but in general he pretty much stays the same. This is also true in this movie, so while watching him go toe to toe with Yael, and having his pride hurt is very entertaining, it lacks a bit too much in shining a new light on Jigen as a character. There really isn't much we learn about him that we didn't already know from before. Jigen losing a gunfight in the main series, or other spin-offs, generally gets played up for laughs, and sometimes drama. Here it's played more for shock, but since the reaction to it is pretty much just get back on the horse and try again, it never really feels like it comes to anything. The movie also tries to throw us for a bit of a loop with a twist, but if you've watched a lot of Lupin, you'll know where it's going right away. So as far as this movie is concerned, it's pretty much just a cat and mouse game, as Lupin stuff often can be. A good one at that, but coming after the woman called Fujiko Mina, which did so much for Fujiko's character, I can't help being a little bit disappointed by this movie. Up next we have the second movie. This one came out in 2017, and is called Chikemuri no Ishikawa Goemon, or Goemon Ishikawa Spray of Blood. This movie focuses predominantly on Goemon, who has been hired as a bodyguard by a Yakuza boss named Makio Inaniwa, who runs a gambling boat and is being threatened by internal factions. At the same time, Lupin attempts to steal the proceeds of the casino, and meets Fujiko, who had the same intention. Lupin and Fujiko decides to divide the money, when suddenly, the boat's engine explodes. Goemon heads for the engine room, and encounters the huge and powerful Hawk, otherwise known as Bermuda Ghost. Armed with his twin axes, 
and a pearly row which would make even Jaws proud, he is out to kill Lupin, Jigen, and Fujiko. While Goemon is fighting Hawk, Inaniwa dies in the flames, abandoned by his men. Enraged that Goemon had abandoned his post, Inaniwa Jr. gives Goemon one last chance to kill Hawk and avenge the death of his father. Will Goemon be able to defeat this powerful mercenary who, as far as the world is concerned, is dead? Or will the power of this bear of a man prove to be too much for even Goemon and his trusted Santetsuken? So continuing on the trend of exploring the different sidekicks of Lupin, Goemon's Spray of Blood is arguably the darkest of the three movies. It takes a gimmick that we've seen many times before in Lupin, with Goemon being defeated and his trusty sword Santetsuken being broken with Goemon's spirits also being broken, and him resulting to doing some sort of training to learn from his mistakes and to regain his composure. But unlike most other Lupin before, that is where this movie decides to change it up. You see, normally in Lupin, Goemon would complete some ridiculous task and cut some stuff and feel better. Here, he subjects himself to literal hell, being attacked by sharks without fighting back, placing himself in a blaze of fires and smoke, as well as almost being crushed by a large tree falling down a waterfall. Seeing Goemon this broken and dejected is both quite familiar, but also feels new. He's always been one to get down on himself when he fails and just say he needs more training, but never quite like this. It really shows just how much losing this fight against Hawk has made an impact on him. I really appreciate that. It managed to get more out of Goemon than Jigen's gravestone got out of Jigen. Now, that's not to say that this movie is completely flawless. There is some minor stuff, like how certain connecting scenes were cut due to time, making some scenes feel a bit more disjointed than others. But that is not really that big of a deal. No, the biggest problem comes in the scenes of Goemon's new training. The scenes try to trick you into believing that Goemon is simply torturing himself, since he's not really doing much but visualizing Hawk's attacks as he takes giant blow after giant blow. And it's not until he meets back up with the Yakuza, who is ready to kill him, since he failed to bring them Hawk's head in the three days they gave him, that you finally get to see why he did what he did. And again, it's not until the very end of the movie that Lupin just casually explains to us what Goemon's training actually was. Depending on your perspective, this can come off as a bit cheap, though it does serve its purpose. But despite that, this movie is a ton of fun. It's Lupin action like you've never seen it before. It's dark, it's gritty, and it's gory. If you can't stomach seeing limbs get cut off and things of that nature, then this movie is definitely not for you. Last but not least, we have the third, and as of now, final Lupin movie directed by Takeshi Koike. This one came out in 2019 and is called Mine Fujiko no Uso, or Fujiko Mine's Lie in English. Just like the woman called Fujiko Mine, this movie sets its focus on Fujiko once again. But unlike the 2012 TV series, this time they opted to show a different side to Fujiko. A more motherly side. Fujiko is working as a maid for a man named Randy, and she is helping take care of his son Jean, who has a heart condition. They are all trying to flee from some assassins who are coming to kill them, and take back the 500 million dollars that Randy embezzled from the company Godfrey Mining, which he worked as an accountant for. Jean and Fujiko end up running away, while Randy stays back to destroy the evidence, but ends up getting caught in his own explosion and dies. Now Fujiko has to try and keep Jean safe from a very strange assassin who is chasing them, called Binkam who possesses a weird ability that allows him to control the mind of whoever gets caught in the smoke. What I like about this movie is that they went a very ambitious route with Fujiko's character. Instead of playing into parts of her that we already know, they decided to explore a part of her that we have never really seen much of. You see, Fujiko playing the role of maid or mother figure isn't something that hasn't been done before. Hell, even in the woman called Fujiko Mina, she ends up playing that role for a little bit, when she works as a teacher. But generally, we all know what Fujiko is like. She cares more for money and valuables than anything else, and there aren't any lows she isn't willing to sink to just to obtain what she wants. She also often pulls out her seduction tactics to get what she wants. This time, it's quite different though. She can't seduce this kid, cause he's too young and naive, and even though we know that, just like always, she has ulterior motives for becoming their maid and taking care of Jean, this time, Fujiko ends up getting too close to this family and their bad situation. There becomes a sort of internal conflict that makes it harder for her to just take the money and leave, like she normally would do. 
she starts to care. That is not normal for Fujiko, and it's quite refreshing to see this side of her. Now, that is not to say that everything is perfect here. Exploring new sides to characters is always fun, but when you are dealing with characters like Fujiko that have been around for as long as she has, it can be quite tricky without proper justification, and that is probably where this movie lacks a little bit. Seeing Fujiko start to care about this poor boy who his dad just wants to get a heart transplant for so that he can live a normal life is quite interesting. But that part kinda gets thrown to the side since the dad is out of the picture and Jean just wants to get revenge. It also feels a little odd of Fujiko to get so involved and allow herself to care as much as she does, simply because we know that she normally wouldn't. Previous conventions with this character kind of prevents this new side of her to feel as organic as one would like, at least in my opinion. But even so, I still applaud Koike and his team to be brave enough to go out there and try something new with such an established character. It would be way easier to just keep repeating the same ideas over and over, but it takes guts to step away from that and explore different avenues. Fujiko Mine is a character with a very simple base design, in that the idea behind her character was just like a Bond woman. But it's through those simple ideas that more and more layers have been added to her character over the years. So, unsurprisingly, I had a very good time watching these movies. It's not often I actively dislike anything Lupin related. <coughs> Red vs. <versus> green. <coughs> so that wasn't exactly a surprise. But I think there's a lot to these movies that makes them worth the watch, outside of just being more Lupin. They try to explore some new sides to Lupin's friends, which I like a lot since we're talking about fairly simple characters, but characters that have been around for quite a few decades at this point. Seeing Jigen's more serious side, Goemon broken down but still being able to pick himself back up and learn from his failures, and Fujiko's more motherly side does help add a bit of extra character to them. More so for Fujiko than the other two in my opinion, but it's still nice to get to know more about how these guys tick. All we needed for that was a bit of a darker than normal take on the well-tested Lupin formula. Now this isn't to say that the woman called Fujiko Mine or the Takeshi Koike movies are the first or only darker takes on Lupin. Just off the top of my head we've got the 97 special Walther P38, or Island of Assassins in English, which is also a darker take on Lupin. But I do think that the 2012 series and these movies did more for the characters of Lupin's gang than a lot of the other spin-off series have done before it. So because of that, I'd say that these three Lupin movies are definitely worth the watch. Even if you don't like darker and more violent stuff, I'd still give this a shot. They managed to breathe a bit of new life into this old franchise by returning the less family-friendly element that has been mostly gone from the Lupin franchise for a very long time. So that was the Takeshi Koike Lupin trilogy. At least the trilogy for now. We might see more of these types of Lupin spin-off movies, and I hope we do. They are a lot of fun, and a good different take on the series. There's also still some unresolved plot left to get to, plus we still haven't had a movie focus on Lupin, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was next on the cards. Or maybe even a movie on Senigata. Either way, I'm excited for more of the Keshikoikis Lupin. It's quite refreshing. I'm also glad that I could finally make another video on Lupin. It's been far too long. I have some other Lupin related content planned for the future as well, so I hope you'll stick around for that. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, then don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more anime related content from the Anime Top Scholar. Peace.